This video is brought to you by contributions to patreon.com slash Henry Kathman from viewers like you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, sweet God. Oh, God. <laughs> It's a basic summary of my thoughts when watching through the recent Adventure Time miniseries Fiona and Cake for the first time. Despite ushering in one of the biggest shifts within the art of animation, it's astonishing to see the ways that Adventure Time manages to change its status quo within the expected staples found in the world of Ooh. After all of these years since its original air date in 2010, through nearly 300 episodes of television, its evolution from broadcast to streaming, through all the massive shifts we have seen in the world, no matter how long it's been, everything about this show has stayed. Right where we left it. Everything stays. But it still changes! If there is one word that might describe the themes of Adventure Time, it would be recurrence. The notion of repeating some part of the past in an endless cycle of repetition. Some see this as an expectation for the different serialized shows that have come and gone since 2010. After all, part of Adventure Time's initial success could be found in its perceived lack of continuity. As most episodes were made to be self-contained adventures that could be watched in any order, allowing for the show to onboard new audience members with little difficulty. Something that set the show apart from other animated productions was its effective use of storyboard-driven writing, allowing for the storyboard artist of the show to help plan out different plot beats from a broad outline. This would allow the different artists who worked on the show to include little references to their colleagues' episodes while developing their own stories, resulting in a collaborative continuity emerging from the show. But even when the show began to flesh out that continuity, it never strayed away from the carefree spirit that helped to define these characters. This is how you can have an episode about Finn and Jake fighting an army of magical penguin clones preceding the most emotionally devastating 11 minutes of television put to screen. But the most wild thing about this is how neither episodes feel out of place within the identity of Adventure Time. But then again, part of the appeal of the show is the sheer chaos that occurs as part of the world. This is a show where the following things are completely canon. An island colony of humans living inside a VR chat. A neurodivergent coded dragon living below the Candy Kingdom who is also Princess Bubblegum's brother. A shape-shifting alien that helped give birth to Jake after impregnating his demon-hunting father. A grass copy of Finn that was created by a demon combined with the sword made out of another Finn from an alternate universe. Abraham Lincoln, deceased King of Mars. Let me repeat that. The fact that Abraham, Abraham Borking Lincoln, Lincoln is a vital part of the show's world building should give you a clear enough idea of how willing Adventure Time was to go off the beaten path when establishing the world of this show. Despite the inherent absurdity found within the lore of Adventure Time, like other works with extensive world building like The Lord of the Rings or Dark Souls, Comprehensive knowledge of this lore is not a key factor in being able to understand the narrative core of Adventure Time. Not to disparage anyone who has cut their teeth on explaining and compiling information about the Elementals, Catalyst Comets, the Mushroom War, the Vampire Lords, or the many reincarnations of Finn and Jake, but when you take away all of that stuff, what is the core to Adventure Time's story? When deconstructed, Adventure Time tells a story of people facing a chaotic universe that is stuck in recursive cycles. A new comet arrives every 1,000 years to introduce a new cosmic entity to the world. Someone finds the crown of the ice elemental, causing the wearer to have their identity subsumed by the crown's power. The elements of fire, candy, slime, and ice are reborn to bring balance to the world. Vampires try to take over the world only to be slain and later reborn. And through every age of Ooh, 
There is always a one-armed adventurer fighting alongside an animal companion against the forces of death and chaos. As Marceline put it, Everything repeats over and over again. No one learns anything, because no one lives long enough to see the pattern, I guess. Fiona and Cake puts this dynamic into sharper focus, as these patterns can be seen in every single incarnation of Ooh within the multiverse. There is always a crown to tempt potential wearers. There is always a vampire and candy person with romantic feelings for one another. And there is always a threat of cataclysmic destruction brought to the world. These different elements work to reinforce a concept known as eternal recurrence, a philosophy that has been present for much of human history that was best summarized by Porphyry, Life of Pythagoras. After certain specified periods, the same events occur again. That nothing was entirely new. From the ancient Greek Stoics to Friedrich Nietzsche, the belief that everything is a repetition of past events is one that humans have been grappling with for their whole existence. Imagine what that must be like for someone to feel the full force of this eternal recurrence. Someone who has seen the world transform itself into something completely unrecognizable to what it once was, transformed you into someone you couldn't remember, only to find yourself back where you were when you started. The best illustration of eternal recurrence is found in the 1915 novel The Strange Life of Ivan Osakin by the Russian philosopher P.D. Ospensky. The story, no joke, begins with the titular Osakin seeking help from a wizard after regretting the different decisions of his lifetime. By 26 years old, Osakin had flunked out of school, gambled away his inheritance, and had squandered away his relationships with his family and his love Zinaida, resulting in a sad, lonely existence. In this desperation, Osakin begs the magician to send him back 12 years in the past so he may fix his mistakes, a request the old man grants, but not without a warning. Well, I can send you back as far as you like, and you will remember everything, but nothing will come of it, says the old man. How can nothing come of it? says Asokin excitedly. The whole horror of the thing is that we do not know our way. If I know and remember, I shall do everything differently. Do it if it is possible, says the old man. You will go back 12 years as you wish, and you will remember everything as long as you do not wish to forget. However, once Osakin finds himself back in the body of his 14-year-old self, he almost immediately finds himself stuck within the same processes that dictated his life up to that point. His grades fail as his 26-year-old mind grows bored of his old school lessons. The knowledge of their futures disconnects Osakin from those around him, and the memories of his future self are so painful that Osakin works to forget the important lessons that could change his fate. By the time Osakin finds himself a 26-year-old again, all of his interactions in those 12 years have become a dream that is likened to a transparent shadow, with Osakin having forgotten who he once was, and who he would become as he decided to forget more and more until he no longer recognized the way that his past self matches his present. As the wizard puts it, My dear friend, this trap is called life. If you want to repeat the experiment once more, I am at your service. But I warn you, you will change nothing. You can only make things worse. First, because you will not retain this memory for long. It will be too painful, and you yourself will want to get rid of it and forget. And then you will forget. Uh, second, even if you remember, it will not help you. Uh, you will remember and still continue to do the same things. Reading through Ospensky's novel offers a quite bleak experience by itself. But something that is especially striking about this story is the ways that it parallels the experiences of another Russian who begins to forget the ways he's changed and the ways he's stayed the same. Simon Petrikov was an awkward antiquarian who wanted to better understand ancient artifacts when he first put on the crown as a joke. He spent the next thousand years losing the love of his life, seeing humans leave Ooh, the forces of magic rise to power, and forget the people most important to him. And yet, 
There are certain aspects of Simon that remain even when he is Ice King. He still displays a kind of practicality and wit that has helped him to survive. But above all, he still finds himself seeking out companionship and love. All this leaves him a shell of who he was, stewing in his loneliness, until this seems to reverse. His love Betty joins him in this future. The humans return to Ooh. The Crown and the Magic Men of Mars no longer have their power, and his memories all return. Everything is brought back to where it once was, but it isn't the same. While Betty is able to join him in the future, her mind is similarly lost when she first absorbs the power of Magic Man and later merges with the cosmic entity Golb. While humans are once again a constant presence, they have grown and evolved themselves into something unrecognizable to what they were before the Mushroom War. Never mind how they only want to hear about Simon's experiences in the 20th century instead of the antique times that he specializes in. Because those forces of magic were all Simon had known for those thousand years, what does that leave him once they have left? Once again, an awkward antiquarian wanting to better understand ancient artifacts who once again wants to put on the crown because his life had become a joke. Like the post-apocalyptic world of Ooh, this all acts in parallel to our own world. Anyone who has studied history enough eventually meets the sentiment that those who don't learn from it are doomed to repeat it, with the often unsaid cynical conclusion being humanity constantly failing to learn from its history to an inevitable degree. We place our faith in demagogues that convince us to act against our own self-interest, we scapegoat outsiders in response to larger systemic issues, we condemn the future generations for failing to live up to our expectations in spite of the previous generations doing the same to us. Each of these things will happen. Happening happen. For such a cycle to occur again and again with us always being back where we once were, it makes the idea of doing anything to move forward in life feel futile. Something that is acutely felt by Simon. I don't care. I mean, you show me all my messed up past and expect me to just shrug it off like it's no big deal. Just move forward, Simon. Well, maybe I don't want to move forward. Maybe I just want to sit right here. It's easy to understand the perspectives of people like Osakin, Simon, Ospinsky, Nietzsche, and every other stoic who feels this way. However, focusing on the broad ways our world repeats itself often fails to acknowledge how even when everything stays right where we left it, things are always changing, ever so slightly. Because if there is one thing that is a constant in our universe, is that nothing can remain static. In the Season 7 episode, Hall of Egress, Finn undergoes a similar cycle of endless recurrence. After being trapped in a dungeon, Finn is only able to leave by magically passing through the exit with his eyes closed. The caveat to this exit emerges when Finn opens his eyes and is brought back to that moment in time at the start of the dungeon, forcing him to repeat the same exit attempts for days, months, and potentially years at a time until his eyes open again and the process starts over. With each failed attempt, Finn remarks that it always follows a similar cycle, and he is only able to truly escape when he actively stops seeking out egress, signifying how it's possible to break away from harmful cycles no matter how inescapable they might seem. Until then, the best we can do is function in these cycles as best as we can until our own egresses present themselves once we see... Something's different. Even though Adventure Time sought to maintain a certain paradigm throughout its runtime, you can see the ways that its cast has grown and changed in that time. From its first release in 2010 to now, Finn and Jake have remained impulsive and adventurous. Bubblegum and Marcy still clash over their respective methodical and emotional personalities, Simon still struggles with his past identity, and the residents of Ooh have maintained their chaotically peaceful existence. And yet, it would be a massive disservice to the artist behind the show to say that these characters are still the same by the end of the series. 
their gradual developments might go unnoticed by someone watching the show intermittently, but they become undeniable when you compare the characters to how they were at the start of the series. Season 1 Finn would not have been able to handle the Hall of Egress. Season 1 Jake would not have been willing to address his shortcomings as a parent. Season 1 Bubblegum wouldn't have agreed to take a night off to hang out with Marceline, let alone a night that involved a dinner party with the Ice King. Season 1 Marceline would not have been able to make peace with her mother's death or reconcile with Bubblegum. And even if there are times when these traits of these older selves appear, mm, egging me. It rarely invalidates the ways that every character has grown in different ways. As Jake puts it, The shapes are always changing. Changing is their normal state, like us. Even if we're not changing on the outside, we're changing on the inside constantly. There's some stuff about me that I've been ignoring for a long time. I'm afraid of that stuff. But it's part of who I am. As long as I know the shape of my soul, I'll be alright. While it's true that the world doesn't change as much as we may need it to at times, too often we find ourselves unable to see the ways that we contribute to that change every day. It is rare that the actions of a single person cause that change by itself, but to ignore that capacity within ourselves limits the power of such actions when done in solidarity and consideration of others. By the end of The Strange Life of Ivan Osakin, the wizard reveals that this was not Osakin's first attempt at fixing his past mistakes, but instead of condemning him to the suffering found in this eternal recurrence, the magician reveals the truth. Well, I never said that nothing can be changed. I said that you cannot change anything, and that nothing will change by itself. I have already told you that in order to change anything, you must first change yourself. And that is much more difficult than you think. It requires constant effort for a long time. And much knowledge. The novel famously went on to be a key inspiration for Hild Ramis when writing Groundhog Day. But unlike that film and the many time loop stories that inevitably get compared to Groundhog Day, Ivan doesn't undergo the personal growth that many consider a staple of that genre. One of the most frightening and defeating things a person can contend with is the ways that we are in far less control of our lives than we would like to admit. As much as some people would like to pretend that they are either the masters of their own destinies or slaves to fate, the truth is that we are able to bring change to ourselves and those around us, even if it is in ways that feel insignificant within the grand scope of these recurrences. This is demonstrated by the final lines of Ospensky's novel, where Osakin leaves the magician to consider whether he should continue to move forward in his life. Osokin looks round, and suddenly an extraordinarily vivid sensation sweeps over him that, if he were not there, everything would be exactly the same. Many people like to interpret this line as a devastating statement about the insignificance of an individual person's life. But given the pain, found in the ways that Osakin's life had remained the same up to that point, this feels like more of an invitation for Osakin to take the hard steps needed to change his future. When I first began to understand that everything repeats and returns, it seems to me an interesting adventure, but now it frightens me. The adventure which attracted me lies in quite a different direction. Which direction, I don't know yet. I must find it before I can risk returning. I don't know what direction the world of Ooh or Earth will go from here, but Adventure Time has shown me the importance of seeking change wherever we can find it in our lives, no matter how insignificant it may feel. Some may say that time is an illusion that helps things make sense, and it is true that we often live in a world where our mistakes in history can repeat themselves. But that doesn't mean we need to only live in the present tense and idly accept the same conclusions of those past cycles. If we are able to hold on to those past memories where we have been and remain conscious of the effects that we have on others in the present, it is more than possible to help ensure that we can bring about a better tomorrow together. And I can't think of a better adventure than that. Thank you for watching. Best wishes.